If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Yo, man, it's this episode of Mind Stop it. Oh, <laughs> hey, brother. That doesn't even sound right. Yo, yo, <laughs> yo. For the first 35 minutes, we do our current events conversation before we get into the fitness questions. We start off by talking about R&B music. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, we get oh. fresh here in the studio. Mysterio loves it. Man, I'm just throwing around terms right now. Yeah. just making me sound like an I'm bringing fresh back, dude. Yeah. I've been saying that to what people. What does R&B stand for? Fresh. Does anybody uh, know what R and B stands for? Rhythm, rhythm and blues. Rhythm and blues. There you it's go. Not rhythm and blues, is it? Is yeah, it, it is. I yes. guess maybe it is rhythm yeah, and blues. Yeah, yeah. Yes. We talk about Justin's teeth grinding problem yeah. and his gut health connection, and how he's changed his diet, which has now solved his acid reflux problem, has actually helped quite a bit with his uh, teeth grinding. And the last thing now that he's doing to help fix this problem is take probiotics and he's taking Organifi probiotics. It's 50 billion bacteria, beneficial bacteria, the lactobacillus and bifido bacterium. You can go to OrganifiShop.com, enter the code MindPump, and you will get a special Mind Pump discount on all of their products, including the probiotics. We talk about the brain. How predictive it is. The heart and the gut and how they're all connected. Believe it or not, the gut is the second brain and the heart is the third brain of your body from a serotonin receptor uh, perspective, literally. We talk about the impact of C-sections. We talk about Mark Zuckerberg's testimony before Congress and what a great use of our tax dollars that was. Oh, yeah, we needed that. And then we talk about how Louisiana just voted to make animal sex or sex with animals. Too much goat fucking. Illegal. Then we get into the questions. The first question Says, was said by the chicken fucker. The chicken. <laughs> yes. Come on, man. I'm the, I want that nickname to die. How dare you? <laughs> okay. How dare you bang? People goats? are gonna bring that back. <laughs> I'm making oh. a shirt, bro. Stick to chickens. <laughs> oh man, it's uh, gonna follow me forever. The first question was: Is forearm strength an area that you should dedicate training to, or do you get plenty of training just by working out with? Heavy barbells and dumbbells. All 17-year-old boys who skipped that question. Yep, that's yeah. right-handed. Uh, the next question was, why do women suffer from autoimmune issues more than men? This is actually true. Women suffer, uh, I think, three times as high of a rate of autoimmune issues, and we do have some answers, and we talk about them in this episode. The next question was, can you excel in different areas uh, aspects of fitness that are all very different, like physique, strength, and endurance. Can you excel at them, or do you just get a little bit of each of them? Yeah, all at the same time. Right. The fi- The next question was- Good luck. W- dude, did any of us ever experience a time in our life where we felt unqualified or not worthy uh, besides the entire Mind Pump career? Do we also have yeah. other- Examples. Or have you always been awesome? Yeah, we talk. We talk <laughs> so about. I was like, yes. That in this episode, we talk about experiences, our personal experiences, in this episode. Also, we talk a lot about different training modalities and how you should switch your training modalities and how maps programs are designed around specific forms of adaptation. We have something called the Super Bundle. It's one year of exercise programming. It's several maps programs connected and put together and discounted at something like 30% off. Well, this month, we are going to give away the No BS six-pack formula. That's a program just for your core and abs for free with any bundle, which includes the Super Bundle. So we have the Sexy Athlete Bundle. We have the Build Your Butt Bundle. We have the Super Bundle, and we have the RGB Bundle. You can look up all those programs at mindpumpmedia.com, find out what's in them. Again, multiple programs put together and discounted. Or you can enroll in our individual MAPS programs. For example, if you want maximum strength and muscle, that's MAPS Anabolic. If you want to look like a competitor on stage, physique, bodybuilder, or bikini competitor, that's MAPS Aesthetic. If you want functional athletic performance, that's MAPS Performance. If you want to be able to work out without equipment at home or on the road, that's MAPS Anywhere. Or if you want correctional exercise, or if you're a personal trainer and you want more tools to use with your clients to bring more value to your business, that's MAPS Prime and Prime Pro. Find out more about these programs at mindpumpmedia.com. 
Yeah. You it's don't got Friday a job. night. Oh my God. Everybody <laughs> feel all right. <laughs> Can you please throw in some R&B every now and then like that? Yeah, I should. You know what's funny? Please. I, I've, I been, like I've been listening to um, you don't like- old school hip hop quite a bit lately. Uh, yeah, my oldest is all into it now. Yeah, uh, you know what got you was in the sauna when we were blasting some. Summer. Is that what it was? Yeah, dude. We were, I was wondering that was what my, triggered that. That's, what, what, my, what that's got my high school playlist. What got you thinking of slow jams was the time in the sauna with Adam. Oh yeah, <laughs> you were there too. Don't act I like don't, you weren't there. I, I never shorts. liked R and B. Really? No. Uh, I'm gonna have to tell Taylor uh, that. I like Motown. Taylor's. Yeah, I don't like R and B either. Taylor's license plate says '90s R and B. Yeah. He's all into it. It actually says that? You didn't never... know that all this time? It, well, next time you go out and look, look at the parking lot today. When do you actually listen to it other than when you're trying to get some? You know what I mean? Dude, oh, I can I can get into some I can get into some Drake that I can just listen to it. I myself. like Motown, but not so oh, when I was a, when awesome. I was a kid, now the first one of the first girlfriends I had, well like serious girlfriends, you know, you actually make out with and and, you know, is that what constitutes touch? a serious relationship? <laughs> yeah, I had girlfriends. I, and Facebook, I did that like in the closet. That was in our generation. In now, head. I think what constitutes a relationship now is your status on Facebook and okay, Instagram. Okay, uh, I think that's so. I mean, she would have been. Oh, wow. She would have been my girlfriend. I would have said it. Right, right. Yeah, in a yeah, relationship, you to, your yeah, Facebook would have said it. in a relationship. Yeah, and so her, she was. There was this funny thing about her where because you remember, consider me think. I was a freshman. How old are you when you're a freshman? Fourteen. <laughs> Yeah, you got to be 14 because so, it's 13. Yeah, yeah. Junior 14, high. 15. Yeah, so I'm like 14, 15 years old, and R&B music 100% made her horny. One like To the point where it was this thing where if I put it on, she'd be like, oh my God, don't put that on. You know what happened. Oh, wow, that actually worked. I yeah, so that. that's the I, only- I, th- I actually think that's more common than you think. I think that's what's made it so popular, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. And I think the guys singing it put that together, you know? Yeah. Like, what oh, was it? Like R. Kelly? Who's the big, uh, the R&B, you know, oh, hero okay. of yeah. the day? Of that, of that time? Yeah. Who are the guys? R. Kelly, Genuine. No. Genuine. Uh, that's right. Get on it. Yeah. Ride Get it. Get to it. Come on. Ride what, it. What was, that, what was that one group that they, end of the road. Oh, was Boys and Men. There you go. Oh, boys, yeah. yeah, Boys and Men, Black Street. Yeah, sure could fall into that. I liked, okay, I guess I did like R and B. Yeah, yeah. yeah ninety. Me. I mean, that's uh, that's Taylor's like jams. Every once in a while, I'll catch him uh, jamming all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, not me. <laughs> so, bro, you're barely born around that time. What are you I, doing? I know what's. <laughs> yeah, right. That's, so that's kind of weird. He's in that like time capsule. Mysterio that we is yeah. so strange. He is. <laughs> that's Such our, a strange. That's our boy. Justin, how's he your face? Weird. Besides handsome, how's, how's your face? How's, how's your face? face? Yeah, does my, it hurt anymore? You know, a little bit. Like, so I've been. Is it better? It's. Be- well, yeah, it's progressively getting better. I think uh, I, I don't know. I'm trying to work through some issues. I I, I remember mentioning to you like, um, like I've been having this teeth grinding thing since forever. So I've addressed some issues as far as like GERD and like uh, the the heartburn aspect of it since since like January. Pretty you don't much think it has eliminated to do with your coke habit at all. Well, the coke <laughs> habit I have to keep. So that that's what keeps me up for the show. Switch to Pepsi. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I've been like diving back deep into that. And then you did some research and kind of told me like, Hey dude, uh, you know, this, this, this might be gut related. This might be, you know, more there with, with the teeth grinding. There might be more stuff to look into is the sleep apnea, like all these different things like might be contributors. And so even sleep apnea has some functional medicine doctors will say it's connected to gut health as well. Right, so because you're not like a you're not a big overweight guy, right? Because <clears throat> that can definitely contribute. Thank you for finally saying that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm always the fat guy on the show. That's the first time like you made a compliment. You're not the fat guy. You're the, yeah, you're the yeah, fattest yeah. guy on the show. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know right. what I mean. But you're not the fat guy. Well, I know. You're I, not yeah. fat. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll own that all day. You you're know, just, like you're I'm, just the I'm, fattest. I'm the yeah. chubs. Yeah. I'm the chubs that anchors the show. Oh, shut up, dude. You know what I mean? The majority of our as you're rocking your anchor hat. Yeah. I am. I'm the anchor chub. The, the majority of our female fans like you most. So they do. It's yeah. True. Yeah. This is a true story. So this, I'm huggable. 100%. Um, so, unless, unless you don't shower or wear deodorant, then you're after Sal. Yeah. 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 Well, the weird what? thing is I don't really smell. Don't make fun Ask of my, my fans wife. like that, Adam. <laughs> yeah. Those are my fans. Yeah. I'm the silver fox. They don't shave. <laughs> so anyway. They don't shave. So... so so yeah, so I'm actually I'm I'm trying to take this one on this this more seriously now, um, like I did with with the heartburn and um, so a couple couple things that I've been doing. One of them is definitely uh, I've been adding you know uh, some 
what are they called again? God, I just drew a blank. <laughs> Bro, the, I don't know, supplements? Are you taking probiotics or something? Yeah, like yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, or Organifi's probiotics? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he's like, dude. It's the worst commercial I've ever heard in my <laughs> life right there. He's like, he's like, I'm, hey guys, don't worry. I got the commercial today because I got a story to tell about some of the product I'm using. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's oh that product? God, What's dude. that product called? <laughs> hey guys. I was like eating bacon and that's all I could think about is, is bacon. He, still, yeah. <laughs> this whole place is just filled with bacon smoke. I'm like, oh, bacon. Bacon. What was it called again? <laughs> Probiotics. <laughs> all right, all, Organifi's gonna be hella pissed. Like, because hey, yeah. this commercials suck lately. No, oh all, no. God. All joking aside, how uh, how often are you taking it? No, so I'm taking it uh, twice a day. So I'm I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to. It's it's 50, oh shit! You think it's fifty billion? Yeah. If I'm not making that's a lot. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a decent. It's well, a decent it take amount. two of them a day. I've never done that before. Yeah. So I take a hundred billion a day when I'm taking probiotics. Too. That sounds like crazy. I, take I know it's like such an astronomical a, right. number. Yeah, dude, they make them in the they make them in. I the take six trillion now. I take six hundred fifty million. That's about where I stay. Six hundred fifty six, <laughs> six trillion. <laughs> I'm working my way up to six trillion. They sell probiotics that come. I think now a trillion. They'll say like a trillion bacteria. Are you serious? Yeah. Which I don't that know. Sounds aggressive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At what point is it too much? Well, that's the thing too. You don't want the over overgrowth, right? So I don't want to go crazy with this. Well, I, too much will probably give you bad effects. It depends on the individual, but you know what it reminds, yeah. it reminds me of the weight gainer wars back in the day where you know, weight gainer 1,000, now mine's 2,000, now mine's 5,000. I'm pretty sure more isn't always better with, yeah. with pro. Well, so anyway, like I've been eliminating gluten and all grains pretty much in general. Like I've, I'm just- Which has already cured your- Huge. It's been huge. Dude, and think about that for a second. Let's stop for a second. You suffered from GERD- <clears throat> For a long time, like my whole life, and you were taking uh, pres- were you taking prescription mm-hmm. Pepsi AC or pres- I forget what the pre- prescription is like Nexium or something like that. When yeah. did you start that? At what point in your life? Um, later, like after college, um, w- was, it, when it started to kind of creep up. Was that bad. when you were working for me and you had to go because mm-hmm. of the speed stack shit? <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, I, I remember that. I remember yeah. that as I remember. I was, I was having a bunch of issues. I remember then. you had to take some time off of work and everything. I re- Adam, Adam yeah, gave me some a, problems. I had a tumor. <laughs> yeah, I actually developed a tumor on my. It's not gland. a tumor. It's a tumor on Adam my gave me gland. Yeah. You know, it's uh, <laughs> remove it. It's one. Of, it's an interesting it situation. Give somebody. Yeah, no, I yeah. remember when you first. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for not the, yeah. giving me crabs. It's not an STD. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. God, I remember when you were you would talk about your acid reflux and you talk about how you had to take you know these prescription meds and you know I know that it's it's probably related to food intolerances but it's so hard to see when you're in it because these are foods you've always eaten yeah you know what I mean yeah what was it that finally made you was it because I know I kept sending you articles yeah well I, th- <laughs> I yeah I kept sending- I'm, I'm kind of stubborn you know what I mean I like to find things on my own and so I kept sending him articles you know yeah. you know sal, sal reminds sal, me sal just plants seeds constantly oh you know he reminds me of my mother dude it's like a he pa- is it's like a passive aggressive way a of nurture doing right yeah. no I mean like my mom used to like oh yeah, yeah my yeah. mom sends me like bible verses right like yeah. when she thinks <laughs> she thinks I'm sinning a lot in my right. life so I get like these bible <laughs> verses like she's you may as well just say it mom what you yeah. want to say you know what I'm saying it through a Bible so verse. It's two twelve, Adam. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. South is the same wow. thing, but only with like health science. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, what like, it, the ones that I'll be complaining about something going. I got headaches, this to that, and then I'll just start getting these these fucking articles over from. <laughs> yeah. Him. Well, no, the one that I think that that did it for Justin was I I started reading science showing how the medications he was taking could contribute to dementia. Yes. Later on. No, you're right. That's exactly when it triggered. Like I was like, what? And that <laughs> and that's why I started to get serious about it because I'm because I. I, I visibly have seen my grandma like in her state where it's it's just I mean once she got like Alzheimer uh, symptoms it, it happened really quickly and, mm. and then I started thinking about dementia and like how and then I've talked to my mom about it too because like I wanted to make sure she's like perf- like making all the right moves to prevent it too because it's in you know it's in our in our genes so uh, I was like wow and then you know Max Lugavere and like his story and. Um, I've just been meeting these people that, um, you know, in the family, like they, they just mentioned how quickly and how rapidly this happens and how you've had it like way before you even know, uh, you know, that there's any symptoms involved with it. So anyway, it scared the shit out of me. And I was like, I gotta, I gotta tackle this one and, and do something about it. Um, and, and really, you know, be diligent with it. So and it's making a difference big time. Yeah. yeah. Well, Sal, what's your thoughts on the way I use it right now? Cause I don't take it daily. I just kind of, I take it when I eat something that I feel like, like when I told you before, like I'll have off the grid. If I'm, if I'm yeah, off the grid, yeah, yeah. that's I, I have it. Other than that, I don't. 
You know, the problem with the with right. probiotics and the problem with this kind of therapy is we know that like the lactobacillus and the bifido, you know, bacterium are beneficial, but we don't know much else. Like we don't know a whole lot. We know that when people take them, they have less digestive issues. They tend to have better gut health, less inflammation, but it's, I mean, it's, it's hard to explain just how complicated this entire system is. The amount of information we know now, we're not even scratching the surface. What we're going to learn in the next 10 to 20 years about our gut and how it's how connected it is to our entire health and how how much it influences our thoughts and our actions and behaviors and all that stuff, I think it's going to blow people away. I mean, think about it this way. Your immune system, which is largely comprised of your microbiome, these this bacteria that are in your gut, which help you digest food, help your body, your body fight off infection, infection create the majority of your neurotransmitters, help produce, you know, things that help your body produce hormones, like all these different things. That system right there is older than your brain Mm -hmm. in terms of evolution. Like that whole system has existed for longer than your brain. And our, your human cells are outnumbered uh, by two to one or some, or maybe some scientists say 10 to one. So you're walking around and you're more bacteria than you are human and it's older than you, and the bacteria has been around longer than you. I think it's. I think it influences us way more than we could even imagine. I think it influences most diseases and most uh, behaviors and most of the things that we feel and think. And well, it's interesting. It, it feels like a little garden inside. You know, like where you're. You want to get rid of the weeds. You want to get rid of the the problematic types of bacteria, and then introduce uh, more of the ones that are beneficial, right? So that's the, I've been eliminating a lot and making sure that my, uh, you know, I'm not like putting in the ro- the wrong foods, and then now like starting to kind of introduce, yeah. uh, you know, a new environment. What some scientists think is that it's not that you're necessarily uh, populating your gut with these bacteria because. There's some debate as to whether or not it actually survives and is able to stay in your gut rather than just getting passed out. Uh, Well, a lot of scientists think is that these particular bacteria just prevent the overgrowth of other bacteria or may bring now more that's balance. what i thought and that was kind of the uh, thought process and the strategy behind what i was thinking by okay if i'm in taking something that's probably not ideal for my gut mm-hmm. i'm going to try and counter it a little bit mm-hmm. and so far it's been a, a pretty good strategy mm-hmm. for me i've had a lot of success with this where you know foods where i go i'm going to eat it and i know like ah this is not ideal maybe i'm going to have maybe i'm at a birthday i'm going to have some cake and ice cream or something like that and i know that because i'm not used to eating that on a regular basis like it'll upset my stomach so, so i'll just, sort of contain yeah, uh, and it, and you know, again, I don't. This is anecdotal, right? This is my experience, how I've been using it ever since. Because I wasn't somebody who'd run out and go buy a probiotic because I didn't think I had issues like that. But I have noticed, uh, you know, as I've gotten older, that I'm more sensitive to these foods that I was able to get away with when I was in my 20s. And I thought, you know what? I and we had them. Obviously, we have tons of Organifi stuff laying around our house and in our studio now. I thought, fuck it. I've never really messed with this and seen if it will help me. And I noticed a big difference. And mm-hmm. now I've been paying attention to it. And now I'm, I try, I keep one. I literally have one by my bed, and then I have one downstairs in the kitchen. So in case I forget, like, oh, I go to bed. I'm like, oh shit, we just had that burger before. I'm like, I got to make sure I have one of these. And I swear, dude, oh, interesting. It's made a big difference. For yeah, me. I mean, the, the part that trips me out the most with uh, the the with gut health, and, and in particular the micro biome, which makes up a large part of that, is how it influences uh, your behaviors. So like it can control your, or influence your libido, it can influence your energy, it can influence your cravings. And if you think about it, obviously it's this huge community, when I say huge, again, more than human cells, in your gut and on your body, and they will influence you to seek out foods that may then feed them. So you may find yourself craving more sugar, more fat more protein, you may find that you're just eating more than you normally do um, because they're influencing, they want to feed themselves. It's like an evolutionary like protection mechanism or, or them, they're, they're almost thinking to take care of themselves. And then the other side of that, the flip side of that is your thoughts also probably influence your internal microbiome as well because I can imagine, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I can find studies to support that there may be a link there. But I can't imagine that something that didn't evolve with us for that long and that's existed longer than we have, that it doesn't have some kind of a connection to our state of mind and then prepare itself oh, for what, what I, that may you know, cause or create. T- I tell me one person that's never had this before where 
you just got devastating news or something tragic or something crazy's happened and you feel that oh, shit for in sure. your stomach to the point where I know people have thrown up from it, feel super mm-hmm. nauseous from it. It's there's something there for sure. And yeah. I, that's not like one or two people have said that. I mean, everybody I know can relate like, oh, there's been a time where I've received such crazy news that I my gut hurts. Like Dude, doubled over. Yeah. yeah. Dude, your 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 gut has the second highest concentration of neurotransmitter uh, receptors like serotonin receptors in the body. So it's the second brain. And the third part, you know, the, uh, the third part of the body that has the highest concentration. You want guys you guys want to take it, the heart. Yeah. So your heart, your gut, and your brain, they they make up the majority of these receptors that you know uh, serotonin attached to. And what trips me out is for how long have we said things like I feel yeah. it in my gut, feel or listen to your heart, to your or heart. I feel it in yeah. my heart, or yeah. lead with your heart. Or so whatever. think about that for a second. Now we know our brain it contains an incredible amount of stored information, most of which we're not conscious of. That's that makes up the subconscious. Like most of the stuff that we're conscious of is such a small fraction of like everything that's happening, our decision making, all that stuff is very, very small. Most of the stuff that's happening is kind of in the background that not, we're not made conscious of. Bro, it's and I'm, ni- I'm 98%. Right. Yeah. 98% of what's good. Your, your brain is downloading and processing 98% of the information that's in front of your eyes and you don't even, you're only really, we're only really catching, holding on to 2% and that we're, we're only conscious a, of. And we're only aware of the conscious decisions we make. <clears throat> we're not aware of the subconscious decisions which are based off of this subconscious or this information that our brain has yeah. that we're not aware of, right? It's like a so, predictive algorithm. So you can't tell me that that subconscious part of our brain isn't communicating with our gut and with our heart and that those things are not help are part of the conversation <laughs> and that we're not feeling things in our gut or we're not feeling things a certain way. And that's not just a, a, ba- a feeling out of nowhere or magic. It's based off of information that's being stored in the subconscious, right. yeah. you know what I'm saying? That's why sometimes you ever walk into a room and you're just like, doesn't feel, doesn't yeah. feel right, or I don't like something about that guy, or See, whatever. That's what's crazy. It could, it could be a, a number of factor of things, right? It could be like a scent that gives it off. It could be like just the the energy, the static, you know, energy in the air, and you know, it could be just I don't know. Well, like part of that, part of that is the way the brain operates too. Is like our brain is also predictive. Mm-hmm. So let's say, for example, you you bring up the example of walking in a room and feeling like this is just like bad energy. I don't like it. Well. You, you're right. There's certain things that could set that off. Like you may see a person, body that re- language, yeah, yeah, a person or body language or a location or an event that reminds you mm-hmm. of something else mm-hmm. that has previously happened in your life that didn't right. go well. That was stored that was, information. Yeah, it was traumatic. Yeah. It scarred you a certain way. You got into a fight mm-hmm. or disagreement, and that's so. And it could be subconsciously buried way back yeah. there, but that gets resurfaced. The brain it's becomes like predictive following again. Following the same formula, and, and, and you're like, oh, I know how this goes. And out. because it's subconscious, you don't. You're not. Necessarily necessarily aware of what's going on right. but you feel it and right. so we come up with words like the energy isn't good in here yeah and it sounds all esoteric and right. and spiritual when in reality it's just your brain has d- did about a trillion calculations right and is now giving you a signal imagine if it's like a computer imagine if you had a computer in your brain you walked in a room and the computer talked to you and said okay we just did a bunch of calculations and you need to be on guard you'd be mm-hmm. like okay i'll listen to you you know, supercomputer. Well, that's what's happening, right? But you feel it in your gut or you feel it in your heart. And you're like, why do I feel... We, we've met people like this through podcasting where after we leave, we're like, you know, that person was nice or whatever, but I just didn't get a good vibe. Like something about that person I don't like. You should trust that sometimes because that's coming from information right. from your brain. Is it always right? I don't know. Probably no, not, a lot but. of times, and a lot of times it's not. This is why we mm-hmm. we, we kind of kind of gr- uh, glazed over this the other day when we talked about the whole thing with cops, and I feel so bad for them because imagine being that if we understand that our brain works that way, that it just starts to download all this information that it's constantly seeing, and then it also works in a predictive manner. So imagine being a cop who's constantly around criminals, constantly around people that are doing bad things. Then when you see somebody, your automatic assumption, whether you try or not they're Mm -hmm. they've they've already they've already started to forge that in the brain that you know be on alert like this person could attack you this person could hurt you because somebody who i've seen just like this in this situation three four five six ten other times in my career it's gone bad and so their their predictive brain is already telling them to be alert so now they're behaving in ways that right yeah that's why i feel so sorry for them because then they 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 are they and then they then it gets blows up in their face when it doesn't go well you know yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of crazy, but there was one study I read a while ago where they had women go in a an fMRI machine, which is a MRI machine that you can see in real time, mm-hmm. 
and they were showing like you know blood flow pl- patterns in the brain, which kind of tells us like, oh, this part of the brain's activated right now, and this one's activated right now, whatever. And they had women go in, and they were I don't remember what it was. They were having them think about something, or they ask them questions, and then they had them eat yogurt with uh, with bacteria in it. So like fermented yogurt, regular you know real yogurt. Then they had them do the fMRI machine again, and the patterns changed enough for them to see it on the fMRI machine. Everything else was the same. It was literally the bacteria Weird. that was now in their gut was changing how the brain was processing things. So it's fucking well. Think about wild. think about that too. Like how many times are I mean when I don't feel good and I'm sick, I'm also a grouchy fucked oh, beer, right? Right. I have a hundred percent connected. For me, anxiety and my like, uh, if I'm irritable and if I'm not as sharp with my gut health, when my gut is on, I feel like I'm unstoppable. When it's off, I notice I'm not as mm. sharp. I get more anxious, and and I've done it enough times now to make that connection because I keep thinking to myself like, am I just thinking that, or is that is that a coincidence? And no, sure enough. And probiotics for me, at least, when I'm feeling kind of off, it's like, and I don't think it's a cure. I feel like it's a really good band aid. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it's a cure though. I mean, your diet has to be good. You have to have low inflammation. You have to eat foods you're not intolerant to, you know, and all that stuff. But if you're, if it can be a part of, uh, you know, a, a protocol that helps. And now, can you find any of this stuff naturally, or is or do you have to get it like this? Bifido and lactobacterium, I believe. I think I know lacto grows in uh, the lactobacillus ones grow in uh, fermented, fermented dairy. dairy. Yeah, yeah. Bifido, I'm not. So this quite could be sure. even more important than for somebody who's a non-dairy eater, right? Or, or just you don't eat any fermented foods, or that yeah. that too, which you know. most people don't eat anymore. Right. Nobody has fermented. Like Do you guys eat fermented and, foods? I, I try occasionally. I mean, really, just kombucha is like I'll drink it. That's tea. me too. Yeah, I, I prefer that over. Yeah, like sauerkraut and stuff. Like I can't that. have any dairy, yeah. so I have no dairy. Do you guys do? What yeah, I do. Okay, I just yeah. not a lot though. I don't I mean, have yogurt very often. You do the gogurt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the gogurt. <laughs> we do. We do you, gogurt. We do Greek yogurt. We yeah. do occasional cottage cheese. Um, I don't really mess with milk. But fermented milk. though, no. it has to be fermented. Otherwise, it's, it's just regular milk. It doesn't have it. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's true. I know I don't get a lot of it, and I drink kombucha occasionally like that. But this is kind of how I. I mean, I I tend to try and follow like this. Okay, my you know quote unquote eating clean, and then when I'm off, if I'm at all off the grid, this is what I'll do. Is I'll right use that and recognize food. that, and I think that's why this is a good thing you know to implement if you, if, you know as, as far as like having that yep. in the diet too. I can supplement it that way. It's lot, pretty well established now that the. These two bacterias uh, or strains are beneficial. And I know when you're in the hospital now, even some hospitals will, if you have like uh, intravenous antibiotics or if they're putting on a really powerful protocol, they'll prescribe you uh, lactobacillus uh, mm. now. And, I, and so it wasn't like this not that long ago. So they see the benefit because they notice that it lowers risk of C. diff, which is this really de- deadly, dangerous bacterial overgrowth that people will get in the hospital, uh, especially when they're with a weak immune system or when they're on lots of antibiotics. See, this goes back to what we were just talking about on the last podcast was that this is why I would love to make this guide is if you're somebody who never eats fermented foods and stuff like that, this is right. something that you might want to look into mm-hmm. as a possibility. Because again, we always talk on this show about, you know, we're always pro getting it through whole foods first. I mean, that is always ideal, but it, there's going to be some people that just don't eat fermented foods yep. ever. You know? And I, I just I just read an article that talked about how there's this compound in women's breast milk that not all women produce or in the right in the same amounts that then dictates uh, the type of bacteria that the baby will have also in their gut. And they found that uh, if this compound was low, then they had less diversity. And if it was high, they had more diversity. And so much of it is connected to your mom. So much of your gut mm. and what initially colonizes your gut is is dependent on your mother. And what's happening is uh, bac- bacterial diversity, as long at least as how we measure it, because again, I, like we don't know a whole lot about it yet, is becoming less and less diverse through the generations mm. because you know people are taking antibiotics, they become less diverse, then they have children, less to pass on. Then those people grow up, same thing, less to pass on, and which may be why it's taken a few generations for us to start seeing all these yeah. I've health actually issues. heard too, like, and this isn't like bacteria or gut related, but uh, with, with with pregnancy, like over time that um, actually like the, the hip width and, and has been affected because of, you know, science now. So we've been able to, um, you know, birth, uh, uh, you know, you know C-section. And um, this is actually kind of like turning into like it's changing um, women's hips. It's just changing the uh, like the ratio, I guess, of 
Uh, well, I think what's happening- the population. Yeah, I think what might be happening is that- uh, Are we really doing enough C-sections to cause that to ha- Apparently, happen? Apparently- Do you know how many C-sections told. happen in the, in the Western society, especially in America? I don't know that. I haven't- That's not one of my stats oh, it's, I look up. It's, <laughs> <laughs> Courtney told me this, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> maybe S- Single Adam, the Leo is not laying yeah, around yeah, bed going like, you know what? I wonder how many C-sections Doug, maybe are happening. <laughs> maybe you can look up what percentage of births in the US are C-section, but it's a sizable- percentage in some hospitals it's a majority mm-hmm. where they do them um, oh wow so you're mm-hmm. saying 50 percent or more in yeah some in some hospitals because what happens is when you go in they want you in and out obviously you go in oh i'm in labor they'll time they'll look at your your dilation oh it's not happening fast enough give them pitocin which my is best, a my best friend dude his girl just did yep mm-hmm. she had a c-section mm-hmm. yep mm-hmm. then they'll give you uh wow look at that 32.7%. Yeah, wow. 32.7%, and that was in uh, 2013. Yeah. That's a very- That's a high number. That's well above the medically necessary target of 10 to 15%. So three times more. Yeah, and, and so what's probably happening, I watched a whole documentary on this and I did some more research, is that women are going in, they're in labor, they check to see you know how- how quickly they're progressing. What you're describing right now is yeah. exactly what you're we're not moving them. fast enough. We need to give you pitocin. Pitocin will speed up the process. Pitocin is acting like uh, oxytocin, I think, in the, in the body. So it's mimicking that, except it doesn't have the same exact effects. Now you have stronger, yeah, harder contractions. contractions. Now you're in way more pain. Pitocin mm-hmm. makes it ma- way more yeah. painful. Now you're like, I want drugs, I want to be on epidural. And uh, because this is hurting so bad, then they put you on an epidural, which now you're on your back, you're incapacitated, your legs are up, terrible position to have a baby, right. one of the worst. Very hard to push. One of the worst. You want to use, you want to be able to squat or sit up because that use uses gravity. gravity. So now you're on your back. So now your your legs are up. You got pitocin, making it more painful. So now you've got this drug that's putting you on your back. You can't push as effectively. Now the risk that you're not able to get this baby out on your own has increased tremendously. Now they're like, oh, baby's in distress. It's not happening. We need to go do a C-section. And so it's like this, it's like this series of events that leads to mm-hmm. more C-sections. And then C-sections themselves, you know, they're, they're now showing uh, children that are born to C-sections less diverse microbiome because they're not going through the birth canal. Mm-hmm. Um, it reduces the bonding uh, that mothers can have with, or at least it reduces the, or increases the risk of having bonding issues because oxytocin is not being produced, right. which is that bonding, you know, which chemical, which the baby, the breastfeeding is also, yeah. The and the baby gets with the mom, they don't latch on as easily right. and all that stuff. So, and you know what happens? It's become politicized. Like if you start talking about this, then you have like women who've had C-sections get real defensive. Like, Oh, you know, don't talk about how I did, you know, this right. with my baby or whatever. Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I didn't. I didn't even touch that with my buddy. I was just like, "Oh, okay, you guys yeah. did." Yeah, I don't even. Yeah. You, no, no you, dude, I watched it's a tough one. <laughs> there was one weekend we were where me and Jessica watched this documentary, and I was so blown away by it. And so then, I, you know, I watched more information, and then you see births that are natural with like a a, a midwife, and way different. Oh, yeah, way different Miles experience. Apart. Yeah, it's crazy. It doesn't. It's not like this emergency, like crazy situation, like it is. When you rush into the hospital, that's how Mike had his kids, right, Matthews? Uh, both, I think so. Yeah, both. He, he told Did me. Did he that, say that? Yeah. I, in fact, I believe that he even. I I believe the second kid he flew him and his wife to his, the the first midwife because it oh, went, really because it went so well. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, cool that's cool. To talk to it's cool. That. It's cool it's when you cool. look into it this to see how seems gnarly, but it's cool. How many things <laughs> that we've made um, so so crazy because of the way we approach everything. Everything's an emergency. You well, know? again, I mean, totally. we, we talked about this earlier this week too, but the whole pendulum swinging thing, it's like one of those things where it's like, oh, we found out, we, we've we learned to be able to save these, save the baby, save the mom, and then we went to an extreme to where we started doing it so much to where it became more of like a convenience yeah. thing. Yeah, that's ease. Like, right, right. Yeah, we don't want anybody to be in pain and discomfort. Right. So, yeah. what? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. crazy. That's part of the process. Anyways, you guys see the uh, Facebook Thing going on yesterday. With Mark, is that yeah. Oh, so what? Did I didn't watch it. Did you he watch have an it? announcement that he? No. Made? So he he was he had to testify in front of Congress uh, about Such Facebook bullshit. Oh, uh, what a waste of tax money! Come on now, Ugh. for reals, we're gonna spend money on Paul. You know what it is? Okay, so here's what You're happened. Scared, bro. That's what it is. Here's what happened. Uh, they had there was a a company that created this app that then was able to collect everybody's data from Facebook and then use it to market to them to sway the campaign or whatever. So there may be some uh, some you know breaches of agreement there. So that's fine. D- I, we definitely don't need Congress doing a whole freaking uh, you know, investigation and having Mark Zuckerberg testify. What I think it is, Facebook is powerful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're big. Politicians, yep. 
They don't like anybody feeling, you know, stronger than they are. So like they inflect, assert themselves. That's them flexing it's on them for me. Sure. Dude, that's you should have seen the questions they were asking them. It was like that you had the Republican, you know, uh, uh, you know, congressman grilling him about censoring or, or being biased with Facebook and censoring conservative pages, which is probably happening. But you know what? It's a fucking private company, you dumb shit. Right. Like he can do whatever he wants. You don't like it. Get off. Get off Facebook. Then you had other congressmen who are trying to insinuate or say that Facebook is a monopoly. You know what I'm saying? For a monopoly of what? Social media? <laughs> yeah. Then when they came onto the scene, um, MySpace was massive. Right. right. It's so crazy. It's so insane that what, what they're trying to you know, who cares? Like yeah. leave the now if Facebook is breaking the law and all that stuff and they have evidence of that, I could see that. But I think what it is is they want what they're trying to do is they're trying to politicize this. They're trying to make the case that Facebook, the Republicans are trying to say Facebook is unfair to liberals because, or, or excuse me, unfair to conservatives because they're censoring things and that's not good. And then the liberals are trying to say Facebook swayed the election in favor of Donald Trump because of their information that they know on people and that so other people are like, Facebook. <laughs> and you know why they want that to happen? Yeah. So that people are okay when the government steps in and, and regulates right. all social media oh. and, and for our safety. Stupid. The reality is they- so They're setting the table right now. They are, dude, because yeah. they already own the old media. Like old media, I mean, is anybody going to argue that old media is not owned by government? Let's be honest. Like yeah. all you got to do is tune into Fox- and then tune into MSNBC or CNN, and and they'll talk about or <laughs> CNN. They'll talk about the exact same topic or subject yeah. from two completely yeah. different angles and ends, yeah. and they'll present their own evidence and everything. And you're like, whoa! Obviously, this one's owned by the Republicans. Obviously, this one's owned by the Democrats. This is complete bullshit. So that's old media. They don't own new media yet, but they're trying to. They're yeah. trying to get their hands on it because that's it's, when they have those. That you, you do that big thing on front of everybody, and then you then you call Mark in behind closed doors with no cameras. You say, "Hey, listen, this is you see how this went, right? Yeah, <laughs> we can make this really fucked up for you, or or <laughs> right. you can let a, you, or you can let our hands in the cookie jar. Exactly, that's, that's exactly how that shit goes down, dude. <laughs> exactly. Oh, they they did the same Sh with the shakedown with uh, yeah, with Apple, dude. Tim Cook, and Biggest all that gangsters. stuff, trying to get information. Remember, they they, they said that he was like holding out. Uh, from getting terrorists because you know they wouldn't they give wouldn't access into to the, everybody's phones. Yeah, no, it's it makes me so angry like, because fuck you. They see you know here's the game by the way here's the game that they'll play they'll play the game where it's like we're doing it for first they'll see that there's something powerful that they're not in control of then what they'll do because you know obviously we're a consumer driven economy and we do have we do vote for certain things they'll see they'll say okay this is dangerous we need to be safe. So that people then will vote to have more regulation. So we're asking for that kind of control. That otherwise, if they just jumped in, people would be against it. But this way, they can demonize the whole thing. Yeah, and then make it like they're trying to save our asses. Yeah, yeah. It's Captain Savo. No, it's just, it's absolutely stupid. Leave them alone. Leave Facebook alone. Leave tech alone. Anyway, another article I read yesterday. Here's a here's a good one. I read this and I thought, is this real? If it's not, if it's real, this is gonna be crazy. So Louisiana. Just voted, their Senate just voted on a bill to ban sex with animals. <laughs> so bestiality is now illegal in Louisiana. Nothing oh, shocking there, oh right? Man. Yeah, nothing shocking there. The vote was 25 to 10. So, <laughs> so, uh, I wonder how the, Matt Vincent feels about that law. So 10, you know I mean? 10 people voted <laughs> for pro, yeah. pro, what? Pro fucking what, chickens. What? <laughs> I mean, Justin is a chicken fucker. Uh, that, that I am. That's, Justin that's is nickname, the chicken fucker. So it must be true. What's the what's uh, what was the reason for voting against that? Yeah, pro. <laughs> okay, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like those commercials, like four out of five, you know, four out of five dentists says it. <laughs> who's that one asshole that's yeah, always against? That? How yeah. do you police this? That's <laughs> That's a good that's, question. That's what I want to know. Like, I heard noises over there. Right, right. Or a dog. <laughs> yeah. 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 Excuse me, sir. Like, how do you? How do you even? Somebody smuggling a dog. How do you even catch somebody? I mean, I guess maybe you put that those laws in place. So if you do catch them, well, it's probably to stop people making videos and actually putting it out there, right? Uh, so it's probably people. Oh, well, good luck on the internet. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, you, and you and you're doing it out of Louisiana. All I have to do is do a, go a state over, and I can get away with fucking my chickens. Isn't like, that, it doesn't make hilarious? sense to me. Isn't that hilarious? How does that even work? Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't <laughs> even know how that. You're the master. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Tell <laughs> us. <laughs> that's uh, all thought, your well-behaved chickens yeah, now. I thought. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you gotta I get, put them in their place. Yeah. So New Orleans Senator J.P. Morrill says it's important to, ha to that the state has a way to arrest someone. For having sex with animals. Wow. Yeah. 
They were apparently worried about this. Yeah, I guess, I guess it came <laughs> it's, up it's enough like times. Thing. Yeah, yeah, people got busted doing it. <laughs> I wonder if like cops have just been on the beat and then they just like stop it and they think it's like a domestic dispute, but it's like we actually, heard some screaming. <laughs> that's it's, you that's know, like some the, guy. the new like low man on the totem pole for like cops. You know, what I'm saying like yeah. I think it's like being a bike cop is like the worst thing right now, right? Yeah. How does that work? Like if you're, if you're a beat cop, like there's all these levels. Like you don't want to be put. You're on the like, new guy, so you get the phone call. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get. Like, oh man, another yeah. one's fucking a goat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you get that. That one. We keeps got a, happening. We got a complaint from the farmer John. Yeah, estate. Yeah. Yeah, we need you to go over there and bust them. <laughs> These poor goats. We got to do something. Let's create a law. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh God, bird, please save us. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MindPump for 20% off at checkout. All right, our first question is from Logan Knowles, 18. Is forearm strength an area that needs dedicated training, or do they get plenty of training as a byproduct of training through gripping and lifting? That's an interesting <laughs> Ooh. question. Yeah, you know, it depends. It's, it's you yeah, it's becoming both, really. It's becoming it's become an issue. Weak hand strength and grip has become an issue in gyms. Like the last, I don't know, wrist wrist straps. How long have people been using wrist straps? Mm, yeah, how long has that been around? Like, how long has that been popular? Definitely been around since I've been lifting. Like, uh, I remember- 90s, body, bleh, 90s bodybuilders, I think, made it popular. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting because your hands, I mean, you're, you evolved to have extremely strong hands. All of us did. All humans did. I mean, that's what connects you to the world. So, literally speaking from an evolutionary standpoint, if, if you couldn't hold something- then you couldn't lift it, regardless of how strong your back and your legs and your shoulders were. If you couldn't grip it, it didn't matter. Right. And we did. We are evolved from primates, and primates all typically, you know, have very very strong hands and can you know swing from trees and all that. And although we don't swing from trees anymore, we don't have those types of hands. Our our hands are meant to be extremely strong. I just think that they're weak in people in a similar but not as bad a way as people's feet, because mm. everyday life. How often do you involve like your grip strength in everyday life now? You know, in modern times, like you yeah. never, you never do a lot right? less. Yeah. yeah, unless you're in construction or like you ever yeah, shake yeah. A, a construction worker's hand. Oh yeah, it's always a whole. It's like another animal. Like they've just got this very strong hands, very meaty hands. Well, they're always form. grabbing, twisting. You know, like screwing things in or picking up. You know, heavy ass shit all day, swinging a hammer or whatever. Yeah. So you know, if you're working out in the gym, uh, I think it's better to not use wrist straps as much as possible early on especially to develop that kind of grip strength otherwise you'll always have this kind of imbalance where mm -hmm. you know your back and your legs and everything else is stronger than your ability to to hold on to and grip things and it's hard to catch up it's harder to play catch up if you if you've been lifting for 10 years and now you're deciding you want your hands to catch up because i know for me this took this took like four years mm -hmm. up and up until maybe about five or six, maybe five or six years ago, I would use uh, wrist straps uh, on certain lifts, yeah. and then I started getting rid of them and uh, just focusing on on trying to hold on to my the bar when I would deadlift. And it took me a while. At first, I couldn't even grab on. I couldn't hold on to a bar, and then I could hold on to heavy deadlifts with an alternate grip. And now I'm down to a, a hook grip, and I can pretty much hold on to whatever I want that way, or at least whatever I can, I can lift, my back can lift. As a result of that, um, now alternate grip is an alternative, but it's not the best alternative because it can cause imbalances. I, I experienced, I know Adam, you did in your back when you were doing that for a while. Yeah. Um, so, you know, double overhand grip or a hook grip, but studies will show that when you're, when you use wrist straps, which is the thing that goes around your wrist and attaches around the bar, it actually changes recruitment patterns all the way up into the shoulder. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing your rows and you're pulling, it changes a recruitment pattern, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Right. It just means that your recruitment it's pattern, different. yeah, and your recruitment pattern now is developing strongly around using yeah. a wrist strap. So you're dependent on it in a sense. You become a little bit more dependent on it. Yeah. So then, if you're in the again, if you're in the real world and you need to apply your strength and you don't have wrist straps, you may increase your risk of injury. I've noticed as that. a result. I, I remember back we used them mainly for power cleans, but then I would. 
I got so dependent on it, even doing like dumbbell rows, I was like, wow, I should be doing more weight than this. But I mean, my, my grip just was not as strong to kind of produce, um, you know, to stabilize the weight as I was rowing it. So I, after that, I was like, I'm done with wrist wraps completely. And I've, I think I was at first, like, I just completely abandoned them and, and was telling like all my clients or my friends or whatever, like, I just, I'm, I'm not for them. I get why, uh, people like to have the wrist wraps, you know, when they're lifting, because it's obviously you can, you could feel a nice, solid, secure grip and while you're lifting. You could lift more in a sense, but, um, yeah, it it's to me, it's always been like, I haven't earned it unless I can pick it up with my hands without any kind of accessory. Yeah. Over time, what happens too is like if you're, especially if you're bodybuilding and so you're doing lots of volume, uh, you know, if you're doing 15 sets for your back, halfway through your workout, it, it's your grip may start to fatigue and now you're limited by your grip and it just takes time. It can take time to develop the point where your grip then now can keep up with your ability to pull. Um, now, of course, there are situations where I think you, you probably should use a wrist straps. For example, if you're a strong man and your event involves lifting a weight with wrist straps, which they do, they do do lifts where they have mm -hmm. to deadlift or pull some off the ground and they're allowed to use them. Well, then you want to train with these particular tools. And they're stretching like capacity and boundaries beyond like a reasonable, like they need like everything <laughs> to to hold all their joints in place, throwing this kind of weight around. It's yeah. like, I mean, yeah. I think, I think it really just depends on what your desired outcome is. Like if you're, I don't think you need to, to supplement or do just forearm training unless you, it's a limiting factor, unless unless you can't get like above 400 pounds or whatever you're whatever's a lot of weight for you deadlifting and the reason why you can't has nothing to do with your leg or your back strength and everything to do with your grip strength like if you care about that and that's what's keeping you from lifting that then i could see dedicating some effort towards building that um do or you see it like squat shoes like like i have to squat lighter because i i, I because i have my feet you know are flat or whatever actually i do see it kind of like squat shoes but and i was actually just talking to taylor about using squat shoes because he was asking about it because of his his depth right now he's getting really good at being able to uh, squat deeper and i said you know right now you're doing really lightweight and you're working on mechanics i said where i would use squat shoes still if i were to bring them out of my bag today is if i'm deciding like today i just decide you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna press i'm gonna push the weight up more than i have in a really mm -hmm. long time and it's just a, like a safety precaution for me i know if i got that heel i've got a little extra range of motion that i i for safety purposes like and while i'm doing something that i have done for i might throw them on for that same thing goes for like deadlift if i were i'm gonna deadlift with no wraps you know 95 percent of the time but if also i decide today like uh I want to. I want to see. I want to chase a PR, or I want to see. I haven't lifted really heavy in a long time. I'm going to push a weight that I haven't done. Let's see. Like if I'm going to go like like today, I haven't gone over 500 pounds in a long time. So if all of a sudden I was kind of feeling froggy today, and I'm going to go out and do you know some really heavy deadlifts, I might throw my straps on today just to just to see how that feels because the last thing I want to do when I'm already challenging myself weight wise everywhere else. I don't want my forearm to slightly give and then throw the weight off a tiny bit and then I tweak my back over some bullshit like that and it, it, I don't think that one time is going to do that much harm. So I, and then the only other time I could see too is if somebody is uh, like if you're into if you're building a physique like you're a bodybuilder and your forearms are disproportionate to uh, your arms and your shoulders and so you have really small forms so you want them to look a certain way so I could see doing that but honestly if you're doing shrugs if you're doing farmer walks if you're doing deadlifts mm -hmm. and you're and you're not using wraps to do those things i think you're gonna you're gonna develop some pretty strong forearms I, I think it's silly when when i see guys doing like a shrug and they use wraps because both of those are you know uh both of those are small muscles that you're targeting you may as well develop the forearms while you're also developing your little traps you know what i'm saying it doesn't make yeah. sense to me to uh, rob peter to pay paul mm -hmm. in a sense right unless you had these overdeveloped forms it's yeah. just you know it's there's there's a couple body parts that it, being okay obviously being in fitness for as long as i have i can usually tell from a long distance away if somebody is strong or in fit you can always tell even if they have a sweater on if you if you're experienced in fitness you tend to be able to tell but there's a few muscles that i can if i see them developed on a man that i can tell that they're not they don't just work out but they're actually like real world strong. And what I mean by that is if you tangle with this fucker, 
he's gonna he's gonna you're gonna have a tough time. Well, there's just and nothing. one of them is like hands and forearms. Right, right. The other one is like upper back yeah, and traps, back. hips. If the dude's got big glutes and hips, usually real, they've got real power. Boxy core. Yeah, when you see those things, it's like oh, and I learned that. I mean, especially doing uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, grappling, judo, and wrestling. You go wrestle somebody, or especially if you if you grapple in a gi like Jiu Jitsu or Judo. The difference between somebody who has a monster grip and somebody who has a regular grip is a huge difference in how they're going to fuck with you. You even if you mm. wrestle and you don't use a gi, somebody grabs your wrist. I've I've grappled with like Olympic uh, caliber Greco Roman wrestlers, and that guy gets a hand of he just puts his hand on your shoulder or grabs your arm, and you're basically his bitch. He'll do whatever he wants with you by gripping you. Have you ever had somebody grip your wrist? And able to squeeze your arms so hard yeah. that you have to give up <laughs> yeah. just from that. And and, and so for, I don't know. For me personally, that's always been something that I've always been like, wow, that's that's kind of cool. It, it and was it, a major strength of mine as a kid because I worked in the dairy, dude. Oh, so yeah. you're always milking. So the I used to. So when my buddies and strength. I, no, it's crazy. So I remember I'm skinny kid, right? I was wiry looking when I was in high school. So I wasn't the buff kid out of our friends. But when we wrestled, I fucked everybody up. <laughs> Because I, I literally, I had a death grip. You were grip. tussling with the cows, Yeah, like, even if you could get on top of me, if I could get a hold and control yeah, your wrist, arms too. you're done. Yeah, yeah, I would wrap my arms around you and grab a hold of you. You couldn't do anything. Yeah. I don't care how big and strong you were as a kid. When we were kids, like my friends that were into weightlifting, football, and they were bigger than me, I, I could wrestle two of my buddies because I could control one of them with, one, oh, with yeah. my grip of one hand while I'm fucking with the other one because I had long arms and shit. <laughs> and I never connected that to probably all the dairy work that I was doing. I'll tell you what, you know, it's you about hooking, hooking some bales of hay all day oh, yeah, long yeah. and throwing that around and milking cows and shit, dude, for sure. And I'll tell you what, you know, what's funny about that is, and this is maybe not off topic. It's kind of connected, but you know, the things you do as a kid, when your body's developing, I think that kind of stuff tends oh, to stick around up, more permanent and you might get more like hyperplasia as a result. Like that's where muscle fibers split and become new muscle fibers because like, like talking about you, Adam, you, when we first met, uh, you know, we started doing mind pump. You used wrist straps a lot in your yep. back training all the time. You were training for physique and bodybuilding, so your goal was aesthetics. And I didn't. I never used them, right? Then when we would go work out and we'd have fun with gripping and grabbing things, even though you use wrist straps all the time, you could hang with me, which I was always – I usually crush people with my grip. It's usually something I'm one of the strongest things at. And it's it, probably because you had that fucking – it's a oh, kid that I'm, I'm training. I'm sure. I mean, it makes sense now looking back. I didn't know that as a kid, but for I mean, dude, I every day at the dairy mm -hmm. was this constant <laughs> forearm motion. I mean, if you've ever lifted, Utter if you've squeezing. ever used hay hooks and lifted bales yeah. of hay, I mean, it's all forearm strength. Everything oh, dude, it, in in college, I remember the strongest guys on the team were from farms and from Kansas and from Indiana and. <sighs> They were the like by far like it wasn't even close the comparison when you put them next to somebody else they had just so much just raw strength and and grip strength and and power for me I remember um, one thing that was you know it wasn't much of a grip I had to really build and develop a grip strength like that's something I had to like intentionally work on but what I did have inherently. Uh, was power and like a snap and like that came really easy for me and I, and that's something that I kind of like trace back to um, just constantly chopping wood like that was like oh, yeah. uh, that was a chore that I I absolutely loved and so I would always request that and so every single uh, fall winter like growing up like I was chopping wood for days cords for the entire community I was like chopping wood. Oh, well, it's crazy when you th start to go back and think about all that stuff because I'm I'm thinking too. Of, oh, God, I forgot. I mean, shit. We used to. I mean, I grew up on a lake too, right? So we used to wakeboard. And if you guys have ever grabbed and held, oh, that's the weakest link, right? Oh, dude. Oh, yeah. And we yep. would we would go from sun up to sun down all day riding. And it's funny because now as an adult, I try and do that, and I'm fried, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's fried. It's super taxing. Oh yeah, it's super. Yeah. Super. So my so my dad obviously he grew up in Sicily, and um, he him my dad's side of the family they're they like strength. They like doing feats of strength and stuff like that. And my dad used to do that kind of stuff too. And a lot of the old feats of strength involve hand strength. So like, you know, you know, ripping things or uh, doing yeah. the balance with the uh, with the big sledgehammer. You ever seen that one where you extend your yeah. arm out? You, you, you bring the sledgehammer yeah, to your nose uh -huh. or lifting a shovel with your arm straight with weight on it. And, so, and then, of course, my dad's always worked with his hands. And my dad's hands are like, they're like two, they used to call him. So when he came to jujitsu, 
he actually came to jiu-jitsu with me to train when he was, I want to say 50. This is after, and he's not, he didn't work out or anything. He's just doing his labor, or whatever, you know, labor. He would come in and do jiu-jitsu and people would call him Iron Man. And then it was because of his grip. He'd grab your gi and they're like, you're fucked. Once he grabbed you, you couldn't do anything. And there were times where he would grab people's hands and he would just squeeze their hands and they would tap out from his hand. <laughs> and they'd all get pissed off. It's like an like old man strength, it's, it's dude. Like, it's oh. like out of a movie right there, dude, like his, a cartoon character. Bro, no. his hands- like He just says, no. His hands didn't make any sense how strong they were. But you know, then you go and you meet people that he works with who've been doing this kind of work for as long as he has and all that stuff. And then it makes sense. And you're like, oh yeah, everybody. But anyway, as far as- should you dedicate training to your grip if if you if you if it's out of balance if you really want developed forearms and hands if it's something you're into yes otherwise you just want your grip to be as strong as it needs to be to be able to handle the rest of your training in which case i say use chalk don't mm-hmm. use uh you know wrist straps and uh, especially in the beginning, and you should be fine. Grab heavy, awkward stuff. Right, dead, dead, deadlifts, man, and, and farmer walks. I would oh, say and, and and snatch grip high pulls. I've been doing that shit oh, lately. Oh uh, shit! Can I tell you something right now? I have never done an exercise that fries the shit out of my traps like a snatch grip high pull. Of course, not even close. No <laughs> shrug, no nothing. Yeah, it comes close to that. But then your grip too, because your grip's so yeah, wide. So wide. Oh that's, fuck! Yeah, it's tough. Popeye coming. <laughs> Next question is from more Jojo. Why do women suffer from autoimmune issues more than men? Oh, we talked about this not yeah. that long Did you ago. guys know the, the statistics on this? So You've yeah. actually, I think, dropped this before. So I think something like over 70% of autoimmune issue cases uh, or diagnosis in, in, in America go to women. Hmm. So women actually, the vast majority of autoimmune uh, issues go to women. Women are something like three times as likely to suffer from autoimmune issues. Is it because of the hormonal difference? So there's a few, there's a couple reasons. One is the X chromosome carries more genes that affect the immune system than the Y chromosome. So men obviously have an X and Y chromosome, women have two X chromosomes. So they have more of these genes that control the immune system. Now that's good and bad. Good in the sense that women tend to fight off infection uh, better than men and they t- tend to live longer than men. But this, the payback, or not the payback, I should say the flip side of that is that their immune system becomes uh, a little bit more hypervigilant. Then on top of that, uh, the estrogen hormone uh, promotes a, more, a stronger immune response. And of course, women have uh, higher levels of estrogen uh, in the body. Now, I think women evolved to have these things because women evolved many different reasons, but one of them is to be able to bear life. And so they need to be able to fight off infection more. They need to have a more versatile immune system. Again, we talked about this earlier. They pass on the microbiome, all that stuff. Um, and so they're just, it's just their, their, their immune systems tend to be hyper, more hypervigilant. And women are also more sensitive in my experience. And there's also some evidence to, to support this, that women are more sensitive to like uh, stress on their body. So like if they fast more often, if they work out too hard or if they lose more sleep, then they tend, their bodies tend to go into, you know, these states of, you know, either autoimmune or HPA axis dysfunction at higher or faster rates than men do. Um, and it may just be a protection mechanism. You know what I'm saying? I think it's only fair. But, <laughs> I mean, they're they're already smarter and more attractive than us. So yeah, they can't they can't have better guts too. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Have you guys noticed this with clients? Like, where uh, where uh, you know? To I, be honest with you, like I, when you do coaching, my, you see more damaged metabolism. Yeah, and I I wish that I had the the level of education, knowledge, and experience that I have now. Uh, looking back, you know, ten plus years ago, right? Like. What, where I'm at now compared to where I was, like these are the type of things that I, I think of right away because I didn't realize back then uh, how popular and how common it was and how much it can be a limiting factor on your client's success, right? Like when you get, when a, a client hires you or they would hire you, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it'd be, you know, I, I want to look this way or I want to lose this weight or I want to build muscle. And that's all we ever talk about. And so all of my research, all of my conversations, everything we talk about is, around that. And so I wasn't addressing a lot of the stress about sleep and a lot of potential autoimmune stuff, or if they were allergic to certain foods, like these types of conversations I wasn't having. So I didn't really start to see the rise of it or, or what seemed like there was a rise of it when I got into like coaching, you know, bodybuilders and women's uh, bikini athletes, then you start to see more and more of this. And so it seems like it's 
super common or more common, but I also don't know, me being honest, I don't know if it was more common before. I wish I would have known that because I wouldn't have been surprised if I had probably clients that were getting flare-ups, retaining water, holdings with that, thinking that they weren't seeing the results from whatever program or diet I had them on, and they were really getting some sort of a reaction. And so I'm sure that uh, I had a lot of people that struggled with that. I didn't even know, you know? Yeah, you know, uh, like the clients that I'll work with now, typically if somebody comes to me and uh, I'm going to find that their metabolism is adapted in a too strong of of a way in the negative in the sense that it's much slower or if we're going to notice like hormonal imbalances. Now with men, we are seeing lower testosterone start to happen, but um, you know that's that that's probably that's probably related to in, like more environmental factors or anything. I've noticed women's bodies reacting a little bit more strongly to over application of exercise intensity and dieting. And again, I think it's just... you think it's also exposure to beauty products like we had mentioned? It could be. It could be all of those things. You know, if you just like add in volume of like all these factors. I mean, it could be. I just think, I think that the, like here's what happens to a woman and this is forget beauty products, forget chemicals. If you get a woman to a certain body fat percentage, her her body, her hormones and everything will shift significantly to the point where she stops having a period and she can't have a baby. That doesn't happen to a man until you get to ridiculously extreme levels. Mm. Like if I take a guy from, you know, 12% body fat, which is relatively lean, and I get him down to, let's say, 7% body fat, which is pretty damn lean. It's not like bodybuilder shredded, but it's like you got a six pack and you're looking pretty shredded. His testosterone, his hormones, his body, not going to be too different, at least if he does it the right way. If I take a woman and I get her, body fat. yeah. If I get a woman yeah. down to, she'll probably lose her her period. She's yeah. even if I get her down to twelve or thirteen percent body right, fat, right. which is very lean for a woman, right. like so twice as much body fat than than the guy. Many of them will lose their period and hormones will start to shift and change. And I think it's just again the body is like, oh, we need to we need to make sure we can't have a baby because we don't have enough fat and we're not getting enough calories and there's too much stress on us type of deal. Um, fasting, there's a little bit of research too on fasting to show like guys can do this like constant fasting every single day. And some women, if they do that, they start to get some of those negative side effects, which is why I, you know, I, I say fasting on a consistent, you know, regular basis may not be a great idea for a lot well, of people. Well, this is, remember we brought it the other day and you said that it's like a stress, right? I said it was like a stress. It can and, be. Yeah. And, and I think you, I think you corrected me and said that some, Walter, Dr. Walter Longo hates it when people say it's a yeah. stress, but I think it can be a stress. I know. I, yeah. I look at it like that. I think yeah. it's, that's why I also tell people too, that it's an advanced way of eating in my opinion. I think, which sounds crazy, right? Eat, not eating or restricting from food. But I mean, I was just talking to somebody on my Instagram the other day that was asking all these fasting questions. And I'm like, they're fasting every single day. And their question has, is always, these people are always about, it's about fat loss. It's about weight loss. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm fasting every day and I'm only eating one meal a day and I'm still not losing weight. I'm like, that's not, that's yeah. not what you should be doing. Like, well, it's, that's why, yeah, it's not just calories in and out. It's not just this math problem you're dealing no. with. Like, yeah, there's a lot more variables and factors to consider and, with that. And you, if you do it every day, it's only a matter of time before the body gets adapted to that and becomes right. efficient. Metabolism slows down and becomes more efficient at the amount of calories that you're getting and there's also, you know, something else to consider too is your your state of mind can definitely, I think, affect uh, your health uh, and it can affect autoimmune issues. And uh, the stereotype, of course, is that women worry more or stress more or whatever. And the, the, the research actually shows that there's some truth to this. Now, it may be that women have more to worry about um, in the sense that they tend to do most of the household chores and they also tend to bear the brunt of the burden if, there's a, if they're a single parent or whatever. Um, that may be, play a role. It also may be an evolutionary thing where, you know, women tend to be better at multitasking. And mm-hmm. just this, again, just on an individual basis, there's going to be wide varieties. Some men are going to be terrible at this and some women will be great and vice versa. But generally speaking, if you do tests where you're testing a, a person's ability to hyperfocus on something, men tend to do better. And if you test people's ability to multitask, women tend to do better. And I think because of that, they, they maybe they have a tendency to take on more tasks mm. and lots of different things, whereas maybe the guy's like, okay, I'm focused on this one thing and that's it. And the, woman, and the woman's like, I got to worry about this, this, that, and the other. And that kind of stress or that low-level, moderate, consistent stress for sure plays a role in autoimmune uh, disorders, at least in your health. 
for right. sure. Mm -hmm. And I do know that women uh, are take a majority of uh, antidepressants and anti-anxiety medica medications probably because of that. So there's a lot of factors that I think, but scientists have identified that the X chromosome probably plays a role because it, there's more genes that we've identified that are tied to the immune system. Is there any correlation uh, with hormones. birth control? Well, if the estrogen type hormones tend to fuel uh, a hypervigilant immune system, I can only imagine that taking a, you know, estrogen based or, you know, estrogen like type pill may contribute to this. I can only imagine. You know, what's funny about autoimmune issues for many of them, the symptoms reduce significantly when women are pregnant. Hmm. So when women uh, are during pregnancy, like people like women with MS, those, their symptoms will start to decline. I think that's just because the immune system naturally tries to take a back seat just to, because if you have a super like hyper vigilant immune system, it'll abort your baby because it'll view it as a, as a foreign invader. Oh, wow. And so I'm one, I'm thinking that that's probably what's happening during pregnancy, but yeah, it's just one of those things that's probably because it's such a big percentage of a difference. I don't think that environment and actions are account for, you know, 75 or 80% of the fact, you know, the fact that 80, 70 to 80% of autoimmune issues go to women or whatever that are diagnosed. I don't think that's necessarily, I think a small percentage of that is environmental in action. I think a larger percentage might be genetic because we see such a broad, you know, difference. Next question is from Cyrus T. Fu. It seems hybrid athletes are becoming more popular or at least athletes are competing in several different kinds of sports. Is it possible to excel in all three, physique, strength, and endurance, despite them being so different? Isn't that this is what made uh, Bo Jackson so special, right, back in the day? Well, you know, he was, yeah. he was, you know he's it's funny. He's it all. We, had, we talked Bo knows. To, it was, God, it was a long time ago. What We had our buddies from Training Slate on here. Hmm. And one of the guys, he specializes in training young athletes. And he, we touched a little bit on this topic, and I found it really interesting. And and I, when he said it, like I had kind of thought that that would be the case, but I'd never heard anybody else explain it as well as he did. So if you want more on this, go back there. But it, it, what he was talking about was, you, you know, is it better to have a kid play one sport his whole life? Like if I want my kid to go to the NFL, I should put him in football, 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 and he should play football his entire life or soccer. It doesn't matter, whatever sport, right? And they should play that sport their whole life as much as possible year round. And he says that's actually not true. And it, it, it'd be far more beneficial for that kid to diversify his sports like soccer, baseball, football, playing all th all three of them because there, there are lots of carryovers for that. And while he's developing he's going to get a lot of benefits from Just each of developing them. more like body yeah. awareness. And right. Before, and then maybe as you get it later on in life, it becomes more advantageous to hyper-focus on one sport. So maybe, and I don't remember what he said. In the, do you remember, Justin? If it yeah. Was, you know, I, I think it was Dr. Brett McCabe that was actually talking about that. I don't think it was that. But it, yeah, I, I remember that distinctively when, when he was describing, um, you know, like a young athlete versus like somewhere like around uh, after high school, college kind of level athlete where now we're kind of honing into our skill. We've built the foundation of, um, you know, our skill set. Now we're going to kind of direct it completely into and sort of hone and refine, um, you know, that ad adaptation towards that specific sport. But yeah, because that way... You know, there, there's certain things like um, you're going to build all these these compensations and patterns, um, and if you do it uh, consistently since you're like a young kid, uh, I mean, it, you got to think of that from a longevity perspective as well. So, well, right, and then it takes if you're if you become and we'll use an example that I think it's really easy for people to see. Like if you're a pitcher, and you and you like you only have a certain amount of pitches in your arm, right? And you and you're and you're throwing on one side all the time. And if you were to do that your whole life as a kid, as a young adult, oh, I've seen, I've met kids like that, right? It would not be ideal. Yep. And and it, and that person is more likely to hurt themselves somewhere else because they're not strong in other planes, right? Yeah. So making that same kid maybe play soccer or another sport that for, forces them in these different planes and to use different parts of their body. 
I mean, it's, you could you could definitely parallel that to like our methodology with maps and how we try to um, take people outside of their comfort zone, go into a different phase adaptation, something to experience uh, while also refining, like building this solid foundation of, you know, movement and, and, and muscle and, yeah. and, and different uh, patterns to establish. So that way, you know, your, your body, it, it, it all sort of pours back into the cup. You know, you, you get new skill sets, you pour it back into the cup and then you refine it. It does. So what I've noticed with, with kids, cause I have two young kids, I watch them play sports and definitely the young kids for sure. The, if my daughter's playing basketball, the kid that's best at basketball is probably the best at all sports mm -hmm. because at that age, it's not so much about the skill of that specific sport. It's more about the fact that they have good motor skills. Exactly. Right? But as you get older, like now my son's in seventh grade, and as he's getting older, I'm noticing motor skills, obviously you got to be good, but it's also a lot about, or it's becoming more about specific skills to those specific sports. Yeah. And so, I, you know, definitely if you're a kid, do a lot and develop, because you know, your brain is developing at that time. It's developing all these connections. You want to just be able to move really well. Yeah, at that but, level, it's more about just general yeah. like attributes. And like you're exactly right. It, it, just knowing, going through the process of the different levels of of um, like. So I'm I'm starting at uh, like I'm you know uh, like elementary school, and then I'm going into junior high, then I'm going to high school level sports, and I'm going into college. Like the speed, the strength, the quickness, the power that you have to emit. Like it, you know, 10 X's, like each time you jump up to the next level. And so, um, but then you, it also becomes so skill specific. Well, that's on. where it starts to refine because yeah. not only that, you have to, you have to study more. You have to, you have to know, be more predictive. Like you have to have a really good, like, so you, that's, that's the level where you really want to concentrate more on your specific sport. You know, so is he, t is he talking about, cause right here he's like, uh, and I know I brought up the kids, right? No, there's two, just two parts. Uh, you're, I think you're answering like the sports part. And then the second part is, is it possible to excel in all three physique, strength, and endurance, which I, I which we're going to get into. But before that, I do want to say this. I don't know if you guys knew this, but in the Olympics, up until I want to say the turn of the 20th century, so like 1800s. You probably had to compete and, in multiple events. And, well, no, not that you had to, but the coaches considered the best athletes in each sport as the best general athlete. So, if, so they would look for somebody who was like 165 pounds, 5'10", lean and that was the perfect runner shot putter swimmer like they all kind of look the same like if you took the olympic you know Olymp olympians from you know the 19th century and early 20th century and you lined them all up they looked a lot more similar than they do now yeah because then what we started figuring out was uh specialization was real important so now you put a shot putter next to a long distance runner and it's a it's a totally different animal. Completely. Well, specialization and then also the science and the equipment are the two major. I mean, remember that TED talk yeah. we, we've referenced before that those are the, have been the two biggest changes yeah, yeah. in in sports that's evolved our athletes. Yeah. When you compare any athletes on any sports across the board to fifty years ago, we're always all of us, everyone who's talk who follows sports is so amazed by oh my god, look at the way the athletes are now yep. compared to today. And then and I remember being a part the, of the the group that used to think it was because of steroids i thought where we had came with the science as far as steroids as like oh well that's the big difference well in the 50s nobody was really doing steroids and now all these athletes are doing that and that's not true no it's, it's like five percent of the yeah it's or a, less it's a very very small percentage that yeah. has anything to do with that in fact it's more about the specialization and then also the science in the types of fields and the equipment and the, equipment and the tools even the pool oh the tool yeah. the uniforms that they wear the, yeah. uni the, the uniforms the water caps or the way the pool is set up like you're saying it makes or, a big difference oh yeah the turf that they're Shaving running your on bush yeah, yeah. that could <laughs> definitely you, yeah. you don't want that <laughs> makes me slow uh but as far as excelling well it depends what you mean by excelling is the what can you be at the top levels of physique strength and endurance uh, you know categories probably not uh if you were you would be the greatest like, <laughs> athlete of all time <laughs> You know, imagine that, like, you know, you have like Mr. Physique, you know, competitor Olympia on stage, who's also world's strongest Olympic lifter, who's also, <laughs> yeah. you Spartan know, championship. yeah, like long distance world champion, you know, or, you know, marathon world champion, Not super, you'd be a freak. It's different because when you're all of different, you know, um, 
physical expressions, different ways that your body expresses your physicality, endurance, strength, speed, whatever. When you start to train to become exceptional at one of them, like become one of the best, your body has to give up other things. It has mm-hmm. to. It's just the way it works. So, so if, if your body is, if you're trying to become the strongest power lifter in the world, that requires a lot of fast twitch muscle fiber. It requires lots of hypertrophy because you need more muscle growth. Um, but that's the opposite of what you want if you're going to be a, a long distance champion, a long distance running champion. Long distance running champion needs lots of slow twitch muscle fibers. You need you need the opposite of lots of hypertrophy. In fact, you want to be small and light as hell because you got to carry your body. And so it's it's very different. So if you train in all these different physical pursuits, you can get better at all of them. But the but will you excel or maximize how good you can get in any one of them by concentrating on all of them? No, you'll actually take away. It's like video games. You know the video yeah. games where you you have like 100 points and you're building your character and every time you add points to like one attribute, it takes away from oh, the 100. Yeah. So you can either make them all even or you can make your guy super strong or super fast. It's just like that. Well, because I think a lot of people associate, like even say a football player, for for example, like that they have good endurance, but they only have good endurance for that like short window of time, like they like gameplay uh, amount of time where it's like a, you know a few thirty second bursts, you know, like that's that's how they've trained themselves to, you know, like endure uh, really high intensity physicality uh, in that moment. But like, yeah, they're they're physical specimens. Like at that level, they're they look like physique wise, they look super impressive. And so you've seen like a few freaks. Uh, you know, in certain sports where you're like, wow, they must, they must be like awesome at, uh, you know, endurance, at, at, at power, at strength. Like, you know, Bo Jackson's probably the closest I could even think of besides like a Jerome Kersey or, you know, somebody that's just like super freak, super fast, but like, you know, they can, they can, they never seem like they're tired, mm-hmm. but it's, it's very sports but, specific you know, still. But Bo Jackson did baseball and football, which, although they're very different sports, a lot. There's some yeah. complimentary stuff going on there, right? Yeah. I couldn't imagine Bo Jackson doing football and swimming, right. you know, or, <laughs> you know, football and long distance running or something like that. Yeah, we, long distance running would be, yeah, there's no way. It'd be very different, right? But baseball kind of, you know, he's still going to explode to run to the bases. He has to have the good, t- but the thing about Bo Jackson that was so impressive is that his skill set was so was high enough to make him a pro right. in both. Like that's... That's a whole other level. Of, yeah. And he didn't last very long either with all no. that. I mean, you're talking about You saw Michael turn. Jordan try and play baseball, you know? Yeah. Greatest of all time. Goes to baseball. Sucks. Wah, wah, yeah. Wah, <laughs> yeah. Better than me. Sorry, but, Jordan. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah way say, better than me. Yeah, I was going to say, that he's. <laughs> we're comparing him to the pros that he wasn't yeah. very good. Yeah. But, yeah. And I'm sure if he focused on that exclusively, he would add a yeah. better shot. But Yeah, our, you know, like our MAPS programs are designed for general goals, and then they're broken down into phases that focus on – goals that contribute to that ultimate goal. So like MAPS anabolic is like maximum strength, maximum muscle. But within that, you focus on maximal strength. You focus on, you know, bodybuilding type hypertrophy. And then you focus on the pump because all three of those contribute to that one big goal. Same thing with Ma- with performance or MAPS aesthetic or, you know, any of our other types of programs. But, you know, all of our programs really revolve around developing a strong, muscular kind of functional physique and what you can do if you like to if you like to train in all these different modalities, what I recommend is go through each MAPS program. They all last about two to four months. So you could do a MAPS program. It's more specific to a particular type of goal. Then move to the next one, which focuses on another type of goal. And, then, and that's a fun. That's the thing. So that's the benefit I could see about training for different modalities is uh, for some people that's super fun because it can get boring to always train in the same well that's why we recommend it i mean that's why the bun the super bundle is probably our most popular bundle is the is the whole year is going through in and out of all these different phases unless you're like a very specific like goal like if you came to me and said i'm a pro athlete in this and this is what i need well then yeah i wouldn't say yeah you should do the super bundle it's for the general population who just wants to be that wants to be pretty strong. That wants to look pretty damn good. That wants to have some pretty damn good endurance. It's and like mobility, and all right? That stuff. All of it. It's, it yeah. encompasses all of it. Yeah, but it is crazy how specific your body adapts. I mean, I love mm-hmm. lifting in the low rep range. Love it, especially for my lower body. Love heavy squats. 
love heavy deadlifts. And so I could get to the point where, you know, I could do a single, you know, rep with maybe 400 pounds in the squat. You could take, you know, 150 pounds off the bar, bring it down to like, you know, 300 pounds or 270 pounds or 250 pounds and tell me to squat it more than 10 times. And that is going to be fucking challenging for me. You know, I'm going to be breathing hard. It's be very difficult. It's crazy how the body adapts in such specific ways. So be, being able to excel in three totally different categories, probably not possible. Next question is from Hooligan. Was there ever a stage in your life, professional or personal, that you felt unqualified or not worthy of doing something? How do you overcome this? Oh, man. It's every, it's every day of my life <laughs> I now. Uh, I can't think of a job I had that I was like, yeah, I'm awesome at this. Yeah. I, I remember specifically um, you know, being a personal trainer and training executives and professionals, and sometimes they would intimidate me, and we'd have these you know, conversations and I'd be like, oh shit, what if I say the wrong thing? I want to come across as smart or like I know what I'm talking about. And then I learned the power of saying, I don't know. It's a very powerful thing to say. So if you're in a situation where you feel unqualified, that's okay. Go in there and do your best and then be okay with saying, I don't know, or this is something I don't understand how to do, but then follow it up with, I'll find out or I'll learn mm -hmm. how to do it. I, I, Very powerful. I think being underqualified is so much more fun. I can't think of, I can think of a lot of times when I came into a job or a situation where I was unqualified for it or underqualified for it. I can only think of one off the top of my head of where I was, I felt overqualified and it was probably one of the least fulfilling jobs I've ever done. And that was working for Orange Theory not that long ago. And, you know, part of the part of the purpose of that was to help a buddy of mine out that was that owns a bunch of them and and run that. But I'd never felt in my life that I had a job where I didn't feel challenged or stretched at all. I felt so overqualified for that position that it got maybe only it really only got about 20 percent of me. And if you're listening and you used to take my classes, oh, I loved your classes. Well, that's, I don't mean I was like just a shit butt, you know, I, I felt that it didn't stretch me. You know, the, the programming behind it was weak. It, I didn't have, it was already done for me. All I had to do was create a playlist, be my personality, p point out things that people are doing wrong and educate a little bit. Like that, that job was so uh, unfulfilling for those reasons. So I would way rather be in a situation where I'm a little scared mm -hmm. and I feel unqualified and there's a lot to learn because it gives me purpose. It gives me purpose every day that I go there because I want to be good at everything that I've ever done, no matter how unqualified I am about it. Like I want to be great at it. And I, nobody, nobody can control that more than I can. So for me, I thrive in those environments. I love to be put in a corner. I love to be challenged. I love to be the most unqualified person in the room because I get, there's lots of growth that's there. There's a lot of opportunity there. And I'm the one that dictate, dictates that. It's me who decides if I'm going to put the extra hours in studying or stay late after work or ask the questions that I need to ask to learn. Like Those things to me, like you don't want to be the other way. The other side fucking sucks. Mm -hmm. Being the overqualified person in a, in a room. It's safe. That's why some people do ah, it. Yeah. Fuck, you know what I mean? Safe, safe yeah. is boring. It's so boring. Yeah, it's so boring it's a slow and, so, death. and unfulfilling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's you're like, imagine working on a like a conveyor belt, belt line and you're just doing something for your job every day, the same thing over and over again. Like that would be absolute, complete torture. You know what yeah. I mean? The, the very first uh, time I became a manager, I was super fired up super motivated but also extremely terrified i had no i was i became a personal trainer at the age of 18 four months later they give me one of the biggest clubs in the area to manage the fitness department so i'm a fitness manager with four months of personal training experience no idea what the systems were like i had no idea what you know i had to do with i don't know how to hire i don't know when I can fire people, I didn't know scheduling. I didn't know the Apex uh, nutrition plan, which uh, at the time, 24 Fitness had Apex, and that was the nutrition plan. I had no idea. I didn't even know what it was. I had no idea what it was. And in fact, I didn't sell very much of it because I didn't know what it was. I remember the first month, and I remember my manager coming to me and being like, why aren't you selling more Apex? And I said, oh, okay, I'll sell more of it. And I started selling more of it. And then he goes, I want you to teach my my other trainers had to sell Apex and I took them in the office. I'm like, I don't know what it is. I'm just selling it because you told me I should. I know it has something to do with nutrition. <laughs> mm. It was a very kind of a terrifying time, 
but you learn along the way and you just learn to say, I don't know. And I've gotten lots of opportunities that way. I'll tell you, I've sat in front of so many people where I'm doing an interview or trying to get an opportunity. And when they'll ask me, what are your qualifications? What's your experience? Or what do you know about this? Many times I'll say, look, I don't know much about that. But one thing I do know is I'll learn and I'll work my ass off and I'll become one of the best people at it. And people love to hear that. And it's Mm -hmm. very, and for me, I believe that. I believe I can do that, you know, but being, you know, feeling like you don't, like you're not worthy of something, of something, you're worthy of whatever you get. So if you're in a situation, you're in a position, well, you're worthy of it. Now continue to prove it. Go in there and do your absolute best and learn and grow. And that's kind of what it's all about. I, I, I'm with Adam. It's the yeah. opposite of that is shit. Oh, it's I, all it's awful. I wish I had examples. Yeah, it's literally been my mo since forever that I can. Th- I was trying to think of jobs where I just felt like I, I went into it. And I'm like, oh my god, I know everything. I know everything going into this. <laughs> everything's gonna be great. Like uh, I can only think of Orange Theory. That's the only thing that comes to my mind. I'm no, like, I know that's a great example. I'm racking my brain right now, going like, where was there ever <laughs> a job that I did where I was like super qualified or like way over like where they told you what? What movie is that? Is it yeah. uh, what's the one where he is the guy who uh, he gets his boss to give him a year's pay? American Beauty. And oh, he and he yeah. goes to work at Burger King. And the, <laughs> the kid, the, like the the twenty year old kids like interviewing him. He's like, uh, "Sir, you're a little overqualified." He's like, "No, I want to do it. Put me in the back. I'll flip burgers. Like whatever." <laughs> like I've never had only Orange Theory is the only job where I walked into it, and it's it's a great I think job for a trainer that's like just getting getting started and stuff like that. I think it's an excellent place. I think it's a great company and lots of positive things, but. You know, if you've been training for a really long time, teaching group classes is kind of, you know, going the other direction. Well, it's, um, let's it's, be honest, like Mind Pump. Let's just talk about Mind Pump for a second. N- we had zero. Nobody knows. We had zero <laughs> understanding. Anything about podcasts. We still, still don't know what the fuck we're doing. Yeah, oh, we're writing no. the book as we go along. We I are. mean, literally, Doug had equipment. Because he thought it was a cool hobby, so he had the. But don't you remember when we went? Well, I re- yeah. I remember because I I mean I knew Justin really well. I knew of Sal, and we started to get to know each other. And Sal was talking about Doug. Once I got to know each of you individually, were just like me with this. That had the same attitude with things like this. Whereas we all looked at each other and like we have no idea what we're doing, but we're we were so excited about the idea of what we were doing. That it was, everyone knew they would learn and get better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And every day is that. Every day is a process of us learning and getting learning and getting better. And there's, and I think that's part of what fulfills me personally so much with this job over anything else that we've ever done. Because every day, I mean, yesterday, right? I was getting feedback from Katrina. Always listens to all, not only all the podcasts, but also any interviews that I do and stuff. And I said, "Hey, did you listen to this interview?" And I had sent it to her the other day, and she's like, "You were awful." You know, it's just, you're right. and I'm oh, like, well, yeah, that stings. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, it stings, but I so love it. You really feel honey. Right, yeah. right. She was, and I was like, well, you got to give me more feedback. And it was just awful. You know, she goes, well, you just. It's like, I made a list. She, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. She's like, well, you were, and she gave you me, you know, down. you're rambling and doing this and doing that. And you told this story terrible and you exaggerated this point. Like, you know, so she just called me on all my shit and the, and I, but I like that. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's an area that we're like. I wasn't doing a lot of interviews just a year ago mm-hmm. and just in the last probably three or four months, that's ramped up a lot. And I know I'm not good at it. It's different than talking to the two of you. When we, we have created a incredible dynamic amongst the three of us. And that this is, this is like therapy now for me. And mm-hmm. this is comfortable. There's no nerves. There's no nothing. But still, when another person has to interview me, it's a different dynamic and it's different every time because it's a different person. So if their skills that are all are underdeveloped or they're nervous or whatever, like that could potentially affect me. And so it's forced me to elevate my game. Now, I fucking love that. You know, I love that feeling of not being good and there's potential for growth. This is why this is that's why I love like if somebody asks to interview me from a podcast, even if it's a tiny one, I tend to say yes, because it's like more practice. Reps. Yeah, it's more practice. I get to get better. I'll tell you what. I learned this a long time ago. Um, that you know, when you're in a situation where you're presented with an opportunity and you think to yourself, "Ooh, you know, I don't know if I want to do that thing. I don't know if I want to take that opportunity." Ask yourself if it's because you're af- afraid, or if it's because you don't want to do it. Or you're comfortable. Now, if it's if it's because you're afraid, then you better fucking do it then that means you got to go do it. Now, that doesn't guarantee you're going to be good at it, but I told myself a long time ago that I will not not do something 
simply because I'm afraid. I won't do something because I don't want to or because I don't think it's you know a, a good opportunity or because it's not something I want to do. But if there's something and I'm being honest with myself and I ask myself like, why do I not want to, you know, if somebody invites me to go speak at an event and I'm thinking like, oh, I don't know if I want to go do that. I got to travel. And then I'll stop and ask myself, am I saying that because I'm afraid and nervous or am I saying that because I really don't want to do it? And if I'm being honest with myself, many times it's just because I'm a little bit nervous, in which case I'll, I'll make myself, well, fuck it. I'm going to go do it. And I tell you what, mm-hmm. I can't imagine the amount of opportunities people have missed in life in business, in personal life, in everything because they were insecure or they felt inadequate or because they were afraid rather than because they actually didn't want to. On the other side of of fear resides success. That's Mm -hmm. a fact, man. And the scarier it is, the more success is on the other side. Yeah, I mean- You get comfortable with And what we're telling you isn't, what we're saying right now isn't that you shouldn't feel fear and you should be fearless and like a warrior- no, what I'm saying is you're going to feel fear. That's always going to happen. You that's recognize sh- it. Recognize it. Make friends with it. Yes. Do it anyway. Sometimes it sucks really fucking bad. Work Somet- your way through it. Oh, sometimes. Not around it. Sometimes it's terrible. I, I mean, I've been in situations where I was so nervous and so like where I left and I'm like, that was the worst performance. Oh, Can I just tell you guys how terrified I was when I went up to Ben Greenfields and did a podcast oh, by yeah. myself. <laughs> that was the most terrifying I wouldn't experience even do that. of my life. <laughs> but I just like was like, fuck it. That's why I love you, dude. I'm, I'm doing this. This like scares the shit out of me, you know, like and I had no idea what he was going to ask me. I, you know, and you know, Ben, he's, he's a great guy and he's, he, he definitely like wants the podcast to go well and help and everything, but he's very technical and he'll he'll give all these specifics, and then he tries to like turn it into like a supplement uh, discussion, I'm, and I'm like, quickly abort! You know? <laughs> <laughs> like that's not my strengths, <laughs> you know. Like so, uh, anyways, I just, oh my god, I just uh, for some reason that sticks out to me as being like just such one of those things that, you know, even down the road, that's just practice. That's just something that was like I gotta get these types of things out of the way so I can get better. I, I think th- I think people that haven't. Um, experienced a lot of this in their life, struggle the most with it, right? Like, because sometimes I, I know I catch myself saying this. Like, hey, that's it's a no good. Big, that's a good point. It's you know, it's it's, it's, a, it's no big deal. Just fucking face it. Face the fear and get over it, right? And and I think about it like you were presented with a lot of lessons right, as a kid er, early on at seven years old. Right away, that I was facing fear and, and only an option to make this happen, and I didn't have the option of like, no, nah, I don't want to, whatever. So. And it wasn't until probably my, you know, young adulthood did I start to put it together that like, oh, wow, like the scarier these situations are, like I always come out of them, I come out of them and I come out a better person and I learn something from them. And sometimes it's a fucking huge success. And even the ones that are huge failures, there's always these great gems of, that I learn and I grow from. And I think because... I was kind of forced in those situations when I was younger. I got comfortable with them early on. And then I learned to like seek it as I got into adulthood. So like Sal was just saying like, you know, and Ben Pekulski says it really well. If I can't, I must, you know, if there's something that gives me fear or anxiety or not want to do it, it's like, oh, I got to do mm-hmm. this because I don't get that feeling a lot anymore because I've gotten so comfortable with that. Now, if you're somebody who's avoided fear and avoided these moments your entire life and now you kind of feel like you're in a situation where you have to this could be a very daunting thing for them but i can't stress it enough that get comfortable with it and get to the point where you seek these things Mm. yeah do things that make you uncomfortable and you'll be blown away by what's the most nervous you guys have been or afraid fearful you've been while doing mind pump you said it was ben was ben greenfield your that yeah, that was definitely mine. Yeah, just being on my own and and not with you guys. I just I don't know. I I, I like I like group settings. I like like two on two. Like you mm-hmm. know I don't know. I just like to to contribute. It's it's when it's focused and centered around myself and like just completely talking about myself for more than ten minutes. It, it becomes an issue with me. Yeah. So for me, I think it would when that when we the first time we did. Uh, where we spoke in front of a, an audience, which I've done so many different times, right? I've talked in front of groups many times and that usually doesn't bother me. But what bothers me is if the context is in a particular way. And there was one where we were supposed to do a podcast in front of a large group. And I was nervous because 
it was a space that we had created and now we have all these people watching and a lot of them weren't familiar with the show and so I I didn't know how to be myself and it I just I what I did is I reverted to what I do when I talk to groups which is I I'm, I give a lecture or whatever and I remember that I remember being like nervous and like oh this is terrifying but we did it and it, and it turned out okay I don't know but do you have any idea? I you know I don't know to really with us like I mean I, I've been so comfortable with being uncomfortable that those things don't really stand out and to be having you guys is like it's such a cakewalk for me because those all these situations, like even the one you're bringing up right now, like getting in those situations, it I'm makes so it a lot easier. For I'm sure. so used to handling that on my own yeah. and like like figuring it out. Like fuck it, I'm gonna do this. And worst case scenario is I suck. Like what's that? What is? What does that mean? Like I've sucked before. <laughs> you know what I'm saying so. Who right. cares? But with you guys, I uh, it's such a comfortable feeling because I know that it's not all on me, and then I could lean on you guys to help that area. That it really gives me little to no fear if i were if i were to think of anything that we've done where i was like oh, i'm a little nervous a little bit maybe about this situation but it didn't scare me enough to even think twice about it mm. was probably when we spoke at lululemon for a bunch of runners because <laughs> that was like you know <laughs> yeah not our crowd too. nobody so, yeah. there was zero people who knew who we were yep. we were we're in lululemon right and we're giving a talk to fucking runners being guys who openly speak out about not being fans of of running that's so funny like we would have done better in front of like a biker bar anything or something, literally know? like you they couldn't like the only thing that could have been more challenging maybe at that time is if you brought us to a crossfit facility and asked us to speak to crossfitters only like you know or some shit like See, i think we still would have done better we would have we yeah. would have that's why i think that that's so it. funny too because we're all what makes us each nervous is a little different which is good totally. that we're not all nervous about the same shit you know what i'm yeah, saying yeah because i think about that lulu time and i'm uh, lulu, i know i wasn't nervous at all for that's that that's the thing yeah like uh i I think presenting in person, I'm less I'm less nervous about that as as I am just being by myself and like uh, talking to somebody that's like super smart. I mm-hmm. guess. Yeah, those, I I don't like um you know I don't like being being in conversations with like a super intellect by myself. Yeah, especially if they have a major ego and a chip as it is. Yeah, because that that's a like, really how t- am I going to fire back? Being in yeah. yeah, being in business right. This it's different on the street. Like we're on the street, it's all good. Like I'll, I'll say because then I'll say whatever's on my mind, and then I'm not afraid of some like egotistical fucking brainiac. Like yeah. I'll put him in his place real quick. But in business setting, like I can't do that, right? Yeah. So when you get somebody who's like a super intellect, and I remember having a, that feeling for a moment when we interviewed. Ben for the very first time, mm-hmm. and I felt the the very first interview we ever did with him when we were when we were first meeting each other, there was definitely this kind of uh, there's a lot of ego in the room, mm-hmm. and there was this like I felt him almost come after me mm-hmm. as soon as we turned the yeah. mics on, and I hadn't I hadn't been ready for that, I hadn't been hit with that feeling, and again you know I had Sal to my side to come to my rescue right away to get, but I was caught off guard, I was caught off guard that. Oh shit! We're gonna have a podcast like this. Like I remember that distinctively, and it it was it wasn't about uh, steroids. It was the Sarms. 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 That's yeah, what which it was. I'm for sure not well read on Sarms, and I'll be the first one to admit that on on this show. Uh, yeah, and he was like targeting you specifically right, to like, yeah, give all right. the science, and the, and I felt it. Why he was doing it? It was this. Yep. You got these, and at the time I'm competing, so I'm all buff looking. I come walking in, and a guy like <laughs> it was like, and and I, I'm used to that, yeah, right? Peacocking a little People, bit. Yeah, it was it was definitely uh, the the puffing the chest out, but intellectually with mm-hmm. me. And, you know, being on a podcast, like not being able to like say whatever I want to say, you know, like that could go really south. That threw me for a curveball. So that was a little nerve wracking for just a moment, though. I mean, it was just a moment. And it's what I love about the dynamic that we have that I always feel like, don't, bro, you have, don't fuck with me. I got my nerd with me, dude. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I brought don't, mine. Yeah, don't fuck with me. I got my nerd with me, dude. You uh, fuck, yeah. oh, don't make me pull that car. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, if there's a, there is though, gun. there is though a lot of power in just saying, I don't know. I've gotten to many conversations with people and they'll, they'll say, Hey Sal, what do you think about blah, blah, blah. And, uh, well, yeah. I don't know about that. You know, tell me about it. And they'll tell me and then, then I may have an opinion. Or if you're talking about something, you know, you just say, Hey, uh, you know, I don't really know much about this, but I'm going to make a speculation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people, I, you know, I'll tell you what, when you're talking to somebody and you ask them a question or mm-hmm. they're talking and they say they don't know, do you all of a sudden think they're idiots and you want to talk to them anymore? No. <laughs> if any, you know what makes you think someone's an idiot? When they say shit that you you're know like, that they don't know. That's wrong. Yeah. And yeah, you're, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're just trying to sound like you know what you're talking about. Oh, when you totally. Don't, you know, so I, I forgot what I was talking. I was talking to a friend of mine and, oh, they were 
friend of mine is talking about uh, training or coaching other people and they're new and they're like, well, what if they ask me a question I don't know about? Like, what if they ask me questions about hormones I don't know about? I'm like, well, tell them you don't know. Right. It's, it's okay. Yeah. Right. It's not a big deal. They're not going to think it's worse you're stupid. to pretend that you know. Yeah, like like if I even if I went to a doctor and I said something and they said, "Well, I don't know, but I'll find out for you," or "I don't know, but here, let me speculate a little bit." Like I'm going to appreciate and respect that more than if they try to pretend like they know anything. But I think the more you do these, because it's inevitable, you're going to do some of them and you're going to fail, and it's going to it's going to sting a little, and it's going to be frustrating, and it's going to be humbling, and you're going to have that. But then you're going to have the ones. That you that you that you hit out the park or that go really well and that you were scared to death to do it and you're like those mm-hmm. moments and I talking back and forth right now I'm thinking about something because I we've got this conference call monitor in front of us and normally when we do like negotiations with companies that are going to take on sponsorships or something uh, we do this in this room on a conference call and I fucking I love those conversations now but those are scary I mean tell asking people for lots of money. Or, or demanding that or risking potentially getting nothing, you know, because you're swinging <laughs> yeah. for the fences like that. That's fucking can be very nerve wracking for people. And I just love those moments. <laughs> I love putting me in that situation that yeah. it's all or nothing. Yeah, yeah you do. Oh, yes, man. Yeah, that's fun to watch. You can handle all the dollar yeah. negotiations. That's <laughs> fine. comes in hot. Yeah, you love that shit. Yeah. Think of the moments that when we hang that phone up, though, like how, how juiced we are afterwards. Uh, and, you know, oh, I, yeah. I'd be lying to say that those don't, those don't get those butterflies going, you know, because yeah. I know going into it, like, Hey man, that's this is a big deal right now. The co- the company is is depending on me to come through on this. This could be a huge contract for us, and I want more, or we're gonna push. And it's like that's a scary moment. Mm-hmm. And if if you feel that way going in that conversation, trust me, you will come off that. And one of the things that always makes me comfortable is I always remember that there's somebody else on the other side of the phone, or there's somebody else that's dealing with this too. It's like. How do you know it's not just as awkward and scary for them? You know, how do you know it's not just as difficult for them? Or how do you know the people in the audience? Usually, that are, that's the case, right? Mm-hmm. That they're not just as scared or just as intimidated as you. Most times, it is that situation. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So yeah. when you get more comfortable with understanding that, I think those. And I guess, I guess, how you overcome it is just get used to it. I don't know if you ever overcome it. I think you'll always feel it, especially if you test yourself and you're trying to grow. So just get comfortable with being uncomfortable and go for it. Because at the end of the day, do you want to be the person who experiences nothing in life and lives a very bland, in uneventful, no growth oriented type of life? Or do you want to be the person that sometimes you go through some troubling times, sometimes you go through extreme successes, but you grow all along the way. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I know which one uh, I, t- I tend to pick. Yeah, dude, I, w- I would let, what are they, what's the saying? I'd rather live on my, live on my, or die on my feet than live on my knees. Yeah. That's mm. it right there. Boom. <laughs> Go at your knees. <laughs> Get off those knees. Yeah. So uh, check this out. Um, all of our episodes have show notes. So you can kind of break down minute by minute what we talk about in each episode and fast forward to what you want to hear about. Just go to mindpumpmedia.com, click on the podcast tab, and that's where it's going to be. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.